Are you a blockchain user if you hold tokens on Coinbase? If you have a self-custody wallet? Someone who's been scammed? Or are you a blockchain user if you've lost your transaction fee to a failed transaction before? Hey, welcome back to my YouTube channel, everyone. In today's video, I wanna give context on exactly why I always talk about Coinos being a potential killer project. There's a certain experience that I have from using blockchain that I wanna share with you. If your blockchain experience is limited to just holding tokens on a custodial wallet, this is gonna be a great video for you because I'm gonna give you an inside look as a user of blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin. I'm also gonna give you an inside look onto a zero fee blockchain that I've used in the past. An accumulation of both these user experiences are why I support projects like Coinos. It's very difficult for people to get an understanding of some of the blockchain issues unless you're a blockchain user yourself. Although blockchain uses the internet it shouldn't be something that's considered to be running on the internet rather it should be considered as infrastructure that supports a better internet so imagine you're looking at blockchain as a whole like a startup and in that startup their goal is to create the mvp the minimum viable product one of the unique things about mvps is that its core function is to iterate itself it's supposed to change based on the response of the consumer to how they experience the mvp if you have a really shitty mvp product your customers will tell you that Right? And it's your job to take that MVP product, mold it around the customer's problem. It's not about your particular solution, it's about the consumer's problem. With the understanding that blockchain is really an MVP type product, a good question to ask yourself is, how does blockchain solve the consumer's problem? And so who are you going to ask if that's the question? It's gotta be a blockchain user. It can't be someone who doesn't use blockchain. So say you ask somebody, do you use blockchain? And their answer is, yeah, I own a couple of tokens on Coinbase. I would not consider that as a blockchain user. Those type of people are really just buying a token and they're not experiencing what blockchain has to offer or doesn't have to offer. It's pretty terrible right now. But the important thing here is that you have to get your information, your opinions from someone who's actually used blockchain because they're the people who really matter the most. They're the people who are gonna tell you how you can iterate your MVP product into something that other people want to use. You really need to understand what your customer wants, what their pains are, because their problem is your problem. For the people who are not technical, they won't even get on blockchain. They try it out and it's so difficult to use that they just go ahead and skip it entirely. That means that the most important experience that you're going to hear from users are blockchain users. So the first thing I wanna talk about is free accounts. If you use the internet, the idea of free accounts is native. You can generally create free accounts for any network out there, any application out there. You make it paid wall based on what services you are trying to use but the account creation process for the majority of applications out there are in fact free. On blockchain, the concepts actually kind of inverted. You exist as a user of the blockchain, not as a user of an app. If you haven't used Steam before, then it's really hard to grasp the implications of human readable names. Even on exchanges, you use human readable names to move tokens from one account to another. So once you go human readable names, it's really hard to ever go back. We cannot decipher these long addresses and actually get to a point where we can easily understand who we're sending tokens to. Suppose we have an address ox4ac.1337. At a minimum, I need to verify the first four characters and the last four characters to ensure that I'm sending the token to the right address. Whereas if it was a username, I can just say, hey, this, this username is at Steve1483. And so it's very easy for me to verify that that's the actual address I'm sending to. So human readable names are actually really important for people to have a better user experience. You actually don't need them on a blockchain level, but you need them for the human level. And that's what's important. How do you get them on the blockchain? If you assume that human readable names are vastly important, then it also means that you have to have human readable names on chains like Ethereum. Well, they've created something called the ENS or the Ethereum name service. And what it does is it maps out a particular address to a name. And so people look at the name and don't have to deal with the address itself. The big problem is that in order to connect your name to a wallet address, you have to pay a fee because it's actually a smart contract and smart contracts are transactions and transactions cost fees on Ethereum and any Ethereum like network. So if you want human readable names by default, you have to pay a fee. And so the question is, is that really a free account? On Steam, you were able to create an account with a human readable name and that human readable name had addresses behind it that you did not have to interact with. However, accounts cost money to create on Steam. Even if it costs you one penny to create an account, one million accounts would cost you $10,000. Could you actually sustain something like that? And the experience from Steam was that no. What we learned from Steam was that the account creation process must be fast and free. It can never cost any money to create an account. And there's a very specific reason why. The moment your blockchain or your application blows up, people are going to want to create accounts and try the system out. 
And it's at that critical juncture where you must be able to allow the users to have access to your blockchain as fast as possible. If you're going to put a paywall on the account creation process, your application will never take off. Any momentum that's created from any type of hype will push your users into the, your service and you'll immediately turn around the mere fact that human readable names are that important is exactly why the ENS system on Ethereum is basically a fee on creating accounts. The next item I want to talk about is that on CoinOS, every single feature is a smart contract. If you're a user of another blockchain, you may say that this is not true. On any blockchain, you can add features by creating smart contracts. That's the default nature of a smart contract. It is an application that can be customized to your particular use case that's on the blockchain. The Ethereum naming service, or ENS I talked about earlier, is a smart contract that's been put on the blockchain. So why is Coinos branding this concept as if it's new? Because Coinos applies the idea of smart contracts being features at every single level. On Ethereum, the majority of the features are built into the native code. Whereas on Coinos, even the Coinos core features are actually smart contracts. A good example of this would be the consensus algorithm. On both Bitcoin and on Ethereum, you can't just simply pull out proof of work and replace it with something else. On Coinos, you could actually do that. And the reason why is because on the Coinos blockchain framework, the consensus algorithm is a smart contract. You can actually take that smart contract out, replace it with another smart contract, and it would still work. The design concept of features as smart contracts is native to Coinos and express that on the lowest levels. Hard forks. What if you wanted to improve something that was native to the blockchain? In order to do that, you would classically perform a hard fork, which replaces all of the code running on every single node. It typically tends to separate the community into two different factions, one that believes in the hard fork and one that doesn't believe in the hard fork. So in order to keep your community together and still pull off the hard fork, you have to basically pull off some magic Houdini stuff. Except that on Steam, they were able to pull off 21 successful hard forks. The last one though, not really. The Steam community actually hard forked into a different community, but that's a totally different story. So what we learned from Steam was that they successfully pulled off 21 hard forks and each one of those hard forks kept the community together. Remember that I said that you can treat blockchain as sort of an MVP product. And that means that your customers are going to complain about certain features of your product. It is your job as a developer of the product to be able to solve the customer's problems. In the last item, we talked about how smart contracts can be used to customize features on a blockchain. But what if there's something native to the blockchain that could really enhance a user's user experience? That is when you want to improve the system itself. But classically, you need to go through a hard fork in order to upgrade some of those core systems. And that is because most blockchains do not come with a way to improve itself. I actually asked myself this one question. Is there such a thing as perfection? And my answer at first was no, nothing can be ever perfect. But it turns out that my answer is yes. Anything that has the ability to improve itself is perfect. And the reason why is that even though you can't be perfect, the path to perfection is always better than not changing at all. So for that reason, upgrading is an extremely important process to blockchains. And the easier you make that process, the more likely your blockchain will actually solve real user problems rather than these fictitious ones that people are telling us that they're trying to solve. If you want to add a feature to Coinos, you add it as a smart contract. And because smart contracts execute for free, you get that feature for free. But that's not even the important thing. The actual thing that's important is the fact that the competition to Coinos, Ethereum, AVAX, Cardano, any of these other blockchains have a very big problem upgrading. There are blockchains with built-in governance or on-chain governance and these blockchains have the ability to also improve themselves. However, what blockchain as a whole has taught us is that coordination is extremely difficult regardless of whether you have technologies help or not. The hard fork problem in blockchain is really a problem of coordination. Just like government, it's really hard for people to say that they'll support something if it doesn't benefit them in some direct way. And so if you have two groups of miners and one of them says that we're not gonna support this because it doesn't benefit us, and the other group says that we have to do this because in the long term it'll benefit us, who's going to win? The political nature of hard forks is something that no amount of technology can ever get away from. Instead, the solution is in architectural design principles. And this is where Coinos really shines. So this is why the last topic about features being smart contracts is so important. If your blockchain has no features to begin with, there's nothing to argue about. If you apply any feature as a smart contract, then it's only that smart contract we're talking about. And smart contracts have the ability on Coinos to be upgraded separate from the system itself. And that distinction allows you to improve the performance of the blockchain without making it political. It's a very apolitical process. 
Now, in the grand scheme of things, if you have a blockchain that is improving in response to the user demands, and you have a blockchain that's not doing that, one of them is going to get to the solution much faster than the other. I'll let you decide which one it's gonna be. Number four, things that Coinos did not pioneer, but they're following along some great industry standards. A good example of this is the use of the WebAssembly or Wasm virtual machine. Wasm wasn't created for blockchain. Instead, it was created by Mozilla, Google, Apple, and Microsoft, the four biggest web browser players in the world. It was designed to run compact bytecode with performance in mind. There are several benefits to using a Wasm virtual machine, including the ability to write in multiple languages and compile it to Wasm bytecode. What that basically means is that you can write smart contracts in the code that you prefer to use. More importantly, you can move Wasm bytecode from one blockchain to another. And obviously the main benefit there is that users of Coinos will be able to run the same smart contract for free. If you have any questions at all, leave a comment below. I'll address it in the next video. Do me a favor, like and subscribe. I'm trying to hit a thousand subscribers, so do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Thank you very much.